Hey folks, I'm Lance Eaton, and I'm here to talk about five tips around using AI in libraries, that is, in particular, academic libraries. If you want to know more about me, check out the description where I have a link to my newsletter on AI and education and other resources that may be of interest. So let's get started. We've got a lot to cover. These are our main objectives. We're going to go through these pretty quickly, but there's some great follow-up resources on that resource document at the bottom. That too will be in the description. It includes a lot of the text here. It will have additional things, resources to explore, the prompts that I'm going to cover. Uh, so just check that out. It's all covered with a Creative Commons license, so feel free to share and enjoy. So tip number one, our fo first focus is thinking about how we might be using this in the context of our work. What are the things we need to bring so we can use this tool at our respective institutions? Librarians are the BS detectors and knowledge organizers of the campus. They are at the forefront of figuring out our technology, uh, knowledge creation, and information literacy. Trying to figure out secure structures, systems, and impl implementation of knowledge and information that are essential for students and faculty. To that end, they are the folks they are the folks that allow us to both explore and discern knowledge and understanding. So I encourage for library folks to be leading with interest and enthusiasm. Uh, generative AI is going to have a lot of problems and challenges. The library can be a critical and insightful voice in navigating it all, just as they have done with so many other new technologies and practices. So what might this entail? Removing some of the mystique and what it is uh, can really be important and is likely to take different frameworks for the library's different constituents. For students, there's helping them to see it as a tool and not as a replacement for their learning. For faculty, you can guide them in their research, re research uses as well as how to think about it with students as a discovery tool. And to those libraries that are open to the community at large, it's a great opportunity to help patrons connect this exploration of ideas, uh, the library itself, and AI in a way that is reinforcing. That is, doesn't lead them away, but has them continually finding additional things to connect with the library. Of course, with those possibilities, you want to leverage some of the best skills. Since well before Wikipedia made a splash, librarians have been effective at helping institutional members understand what a technology is and isn't in terms of its legitimacy to represent actual knowledge. Continuing to do this will be essential with AI, helping people know what it is and what it isn't, which tools to use and when, uh, as well as highlight that there are more essential skills and practices needed before one gets started with AI. These will be some of the most essential things to, to offer. But libraries can also be the spaces that allow for ways of thoughtful integrating AI into knowledge creation, into the knowledge creation regime that is higher education. Helping folks figure out how to use some of the general AI tools to enhance the research practices will be beneficial, especially as we're seeing the development and deployment of AI research tools, which may be really cool and likely even more pricier and expensive given how databases and academic publishers generally operate. But most importantly, in the immediate sense, is creating pathways to navigate the information overload. This is, two, this is a two-part path. The, fir the first is libraries can be crucial in helping faculty and students shift through, uh, rather sift through, the tsunami of information about generative AI that has been happening for over a year. The second part is how to navigate the information overload when so many folks are using AI to create even more content accurately or inaccurately. Okay, but how about how we use it uh, now or how we might be using it. Of course, if you're going to be if you're going to bring that framework to our campuses, we've got to get familiar and comfortable with generative AI. To that end, we have to be playing with it and get comfortable with it. So what are the some some of the ways that we might start doing this? This is the low hanging fruit that can get you comfortable with using it. This might include using generative AI to produce date listings or initial communications you plan to send out. It can also be getting quick visuals without ceaseless searching, as well as creating basic outlines uh, to projects that you want to pursue. As you get settled into using it, there are some things that I think is where it really gets interesting. You can use it to refine and update content that you have or are working on, working with. You can also use it to, uh, to aid you in sifting through information, such as using it to abstract out key points in articles. Of course, there's also plenty you can use it for creating learning content for faculty and students, such as tip sheets and learning guides and the like. It can also be used to enhance accessibility, cleaning up transcripts or providing alt text and the like. Finally, 
you can use it to help develop plans, strategies, and contents for workshops and trainings. And it's also been helpful to make sense of data, particularly qualitative data. Uh, and you can play with that. You can play with it to start to build out components for mic multimedia outputs uh, that could save you time and money for from having to actually use other institutional resources. So what does it look like to use these tools with different patrons? So let's take a look at our patrons. With the students, there's much more to further explore and extend around information literacy and AI. But also with AI, consider how AI might be an ally enhancing their understanding and application of info, information literacy skills. This, of course, extends into supporting their learning and how to appropriately use and cite within the context of their education, but also as norms evolve in the world at large around the best and proper ways to indicate AI usage. There's also an opportunity for librarians to help students learn about and consider the embedded AI tools of the different programs they're familiar with, such as Google Docs, as well as those that will inevitably show up in different databases and such. For faculty, helping them understand AI embedded tools, since many may still be thinking about AI as something that is out there, but missing all the ways that it's showing up in everyday use. Additionally, helping them understand the AI embedded tools and research tools can also help them communicate with and reinforce the classroom what you may be covering in workshops. Beyond that, helping them understand how they can benefit from using AI in their different research practices would be quite valuable. And to no surprise, the librarians are going to have to be the ones that will need to continue to keep their eyes open for changes and challenges around copyright as the legal rulings are still in flux. And so as we encourage usage, we also have to be mindful about what the legal status of such content is. And for the public, there's similar work of educating people and supporting folks in understanding its usage and how people might integrate it into personal, into the, uh, integrate it into personal and professional lives. Additionally, it's important to identify the different AI tools out there. For instance, which AIs are free and which cost money, which require accounts and which are open for anyone. What are the alternatives to AI tools that still provide quick and more personalized returns? Okay, what are the practices we want to encourage and discourage as we start to use and think about generative AI? Particularly because we're still early in understanding all the implications of these tools, there's some things to keep in mind. Continue to try different things. In the guide, you'll see lots of different prompts to try out. Try these out. Look to see how others are using generative AI. Collect as many use cases as you can to help you through, think through how best to use it. Along those lines, try different tools to learn the contours of AI across different areas of use. Document your use to make sure you keep track of what you're doing with it. This is helpful for your own development as well as for folks you work with that you want to encourage usage. Having examples to draw upon are really important. And of course, you always want to note when you're using it. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you have to cite or indicate AI, AI, uh, AI work when you're using it. Finally, libraries can can be and have been the space to provide the critical ex examination of AI plagiarism checkers. This is a continually evolving space and still it's not at a point where using them feels ethical. Faculty are trying to figure this out and some are allowing their biases to accept or reject them without deeper considerations. Okay, but what should you not do? Well, don't dismiss it due to its current limitations. Remember that it is an iterative tool, which means when we're looking, whenever we're looking at it, we're seeing its current worst version, and is likely only to continue to improve. Don't hide that you're using it. Use it and talk about your use. Make it, make it normal. Lots of folks are using it, but we're not talking about it. And I have to say this because I keep seeing folks doing this. Do not put any student work or data into generative AI, or for that matter, don't put any faculty or staff data or work without permission. All right, let's take a look at some specific prompts to consider. So these are four areas that I'm gonna be exploring in the next few slides. Uh, and these I find are the ways to think about generative AI to kind of put them into a box and help us think about, well, what might I do with it? One thing to note is that I'm going to go through the next few slides. Uh, I'm going to show you particular prompts. Don't worry about trying to get the prompts. All of the prompts, the text, both what I put in and what I get out are in that resource document that's in the description. So you can go there, copy those as you need and start to play with them, right? So they're all to be found there. 
um, and don't don't feel like you have to pause the screen or, or anything like that. All right, let's go. So here's one that uh, both th that we all grapple with: uh, getting a list of dates for a given semester, or just mapping out a schedule of some sort. This prompt simply asks to list all the Tuesdays in a given time, as well as to include all holidays. So if you're running a course or a regular Tuesday watch, workshop or drop-in session, this can get those dates really quickly uh, without you having to do that thing where you toggle between one screen and another. So I put this prompt in and in less than 30 seconds I get this as a response. And what's really helpful is what something that was five to ten minutes now only takes 30 seconds with this prompt. And you know that is this is the way this idea of task minimizing works. It doesn't eliminate it but boy does it make it happen much more quicker. When it comes to brainstorming, AI can identify a range of things that you might not have thought of, and therefore extend your thinking about what you might do or how you might do it. So in this prompt, I asked it to come up with an informational literacy campaign about generative AI for a community college library with limited staff. I also provided some context for what that might include. And so as you can see, it provided me with different ideas for sessions, particularly strategies and ways to implement, particular strategies and, and ways to implement all things I could probably do on my own um, but it would take over the course of an hour and this I got within less than a minute so helping me to jump start the brainstorming process gives me more opportunity to refine and build up uh, the the ideas that come out it might all it might also allow me to build out two or three different campaigns to get opinions on uh, to get opinions on rather than just one that is I could come up with three or four campaigns and then pitch that to a team to be like which one of these work rather than just being limited to one because of the timing. Now say that I want to follow up one of those ideas from the previous slide for a full day event around generative AI for students. I can now ask generative AI to draft the parameters of that including objectives and agendas, activities, content areas and more. This can give me a draft on which a program uh, of what that program could look like. And this is what I really like is this iterative nature. I started with one question, it gave me some things, I can say hey let's follow up with this next one. Again, this is a partial representation of the fuller output, but it is already giving me plenty to work with and start adapting and adjusting. The result is I'm not starting at ground zero, but further along. Additionally, if I had a plan from a previous event, say I had something that worked really well last year, uh, I can now take that and plug it in and say, I want to do this. I want to do the same structure, but I want to do it for this topic. Uh, I can ask it to adapt that structure to this new topic and uh, it would deliver that rev revised approach as well. So again, wouldn't necessarily be an absolute perfect translation, but would get me there quicker. And finally, there's using it for analysis. So for this, I wanted to find some library data, but unfortunately I couldn't. Uh, so what I'm using here is uh, something that easily translates to the library. In this case, I took anonymous student evaluations. I double checked the data and removed any personal information and then asked the AI to analyze the data to summarize, analyze and provide insights and recommendations regarding the faculty usage of the LMS. Again, this is the short version, but I can assure you the full results are eye-opening and now give me an opportunity to plan better supports for students. This feedback in particular at where I work, I, I have to do every four weeks and it's qualitative data. Um, it's rich, there's so much there, and while I wanna dig into it and spend hours on it, I unfortunately can't. And so I just can't produce the level of insight and understanding on my own as a, as a team of one, but AI can certainly help me get more out of it. One final bonus tip to improve your prompting outputs with generative AI. The first question to ask is, it should always be asking the generative AI to improve the question you want to ask. Uh, in this case, I usually start with improve this prompt to maximize the creativity and analytical abilities of a large language model, colon, and then I insert my prompt. The new prompt it provides is the prompt I actually want to use and I always get better results. Because basically what I'm doing is I'm saying, hey, generative AI, here's a question that I have. Improve it for me to get better results out of you. And time and again, it gives me a much better, it gives me something that is much more robust. And yes, I can go in and tweak it and adjust it if it goes off in any direction, but it, it has more heft to it, provides more context that gets me a better answer. So those are my five, my five tips for the session. Uh, obviously we covered a lot and it's really just the tip of the iceberg. So 
definitely check out those resources, dive into them, build upon them, share them with others. And thank you all so much.